Okay. Uh, I, I'm not promising I'll uh, live up to Itai's uh, expectations, but I'll try. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit out of my element, and it's not just because I arrived on a bus uh, about 25 minutes ago. Uh, so I saw, yeah, I'm sorry I missed uh, what I heard was a wonderful uh, and very fun conference. It's also because it's a nano conference, and to be perfectly honest, I hope this is not recorded, I'm interested mostly in the microbial world. Uh, and you could say I'm the worst kind of microbiologist because it's not only that I'm interested in a specific microbe, I like to study communities and look at communities at all. So we're looking really at large scales. But after this long uh, disclaimer, I will try to convince you that you need to look at this large scale of community if you want to find rare and interesting enzymes that can be used for nanotechnology. And the first reason why we need to look at... Okay. Okay. The first reason why we need to look at communities in order to find interesting and rare enzymes is that 99.9% .9 of microbes cannot live in isolation. What we see here is a representation of the tree of life. You see the diversity of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And every major branch that has a red dot next to it is a chunk of the tree of life for which we don't have a single isolate example. So all this diversity of the tree of life, we just cannot study, we just can't know how they function if we don't study them in the context of a community. Uh, so how, how, do we, how do we study my, microbes in a community? Uh, I'll talk about metagenomics, and very briefly, uh, we take samples from the natural environment, uh, in this case, soil. We extract the microbe from the soil, we extract the DNA from the microbe, we sequence it, we assemble the DNA, and then we try to bin it into more or less uh, complete genomes. This is a process with a lot of uh, fun and interesting computational challenges, but I'll skip over all of those and speak about one of the, um, one of the systems I've been working on in the last years, and this is CRISPR-Cas. I'm sure you all heard quite a lot about CRISPR-Cas, but let's, just to be on the same page, I'll do a sh very short introduction about CRISPR-Cas in nature. So in CRISPR-Cas, we have two major components. One of them is the CRISPR array, which has these repeats, which are uh, depicted by this gray rectangle, and between them, these colorful diamonds are spacers. Each of them is different, and is, serves as the memory of the system. These spacers is what allow the CRISPR-Cas to function as an Im immune system in microbes. The Cas protein, CRISPR-associated protein, are the ones that carry out the function of the immunity together with this immunization record. So how does it work? Uh, when a mi microbe is infected by a phage, there's expression of Cas protein and uh, a transcription of the CRISPR array. The CRISPR array, which I remind you, contain in these uh, colorful spaces of DNA, in these spaces contain the memory of previous infections of the microbe. Then this RNA is processed, and a, com and a complex of the protein and the RNA is produced, sometimes involving another non-coding element, tracer RNA, transactivating CRISPR RNA. Tracer, for short. Now, this complex can scan the foreign genome, and if it finds a region that matches one of the spacers, it will cleave it. I'm having a problem with this, but... Okay, it will cleave it. Let's try this side. Um, so, this ability to have a protein, one protein, that we can program it using the short spacer and target it to wherever we want in the genome is what created the big... Uh, revolution of uh, Cas9 that we hear about everywhere. Uh, so using this system, we are able to delete genes, insert genes, or knock down genes uh, based on targeting the CRISPR-Cas9 to a specific uh, location in the genome, cutting it, and then using a, a recombination, another cellular mechanism in order to perform this function. 
In addition, we can use a deactivated Cas9 where we don't have, uh, well, we deactivated the catalytic domain so it doesn't cut, and then it can basically bind to wherever we want. We can use it in order to activate genes or suppress genes based on where we bind it and using uh, domains that we can attach to it. We can use it to methylate the genome in specific region. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, and basically bring any complex we want to a very targeted region in the genome. So when I was studying this system and metagenomics, the, the common knowledge was that there are three main systems of CRISPR-Cas, uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3. And as you can see, type 2 has a one large protein that, that does all the functions that we've mentioned. So different, different systems have many functions that take part in the different, uh, different operations that happens in this process, but since we have one system, CRISPR-Cas9, that have one protein that can do all the, all the process that I've shown, this is very useful for genome editing and genome engineering. But then in the end of 2015, uh, three papers were published uh, within a few weeks, and these were papers that for me had a huge impact on my scientific career. I mean, I think cannot be compared to anything that I had. And this is that a new CRISPR-Cas system was identified. This is CPF1. So far, Cas9 Cas that was the most known was the rarest among these three. And now CPF1 was found uh, and shown to be able to, to operate like Cas9. And these are papers from the Feng Zheng lab in MIT and the Kunin lab in NIH. And the fact that we can find even rarer CRISPR-Cas protein and that this protein have the same effect as Cas9 kind of shook me because I was looking at all this metagenomic data and I tried to see whether we can find these in metagenomic data and about a third of the known CPF1 were there. And that drove me to try and look for new CRISPR-Cas system in metagenomic data. So briefly speaking, what I was looking for is the systems that look like a known CRISPR-Cas but are unknown. So these are usually large protein, large protein like Cas9, like CPF1. They also have signature proteins of CRISPR-Cas systems that are uh, their operation, I mean, they function as uh, main, for maintaining the CRISPR array and the signature of the CRISPR array. So I was looking for this element within a wide various of uh, samples, including groundwater, baby poop, and other. Um, after looking into hundreds of millions of proteins, we were able to find one system that seems to answer all of the prerequisite we were looking for. We had a large, a large protein, which we called CasX, close to signature protein, close to a CRISPR array. It also had a, something that looked like a non-coding element, the tracer, which I've mentioned before. And we found only two such systems in, in all the microbial tree. Both of them were found in metagenomics in, and only in metagenomics. Specifically, this was found in groundwater near uh, Colorado. Okay, so we found something that looks like a CRISPR-Cas system in microbes that live in groundwater. What's next? So since we look at communities, we were also able to find a target of this. I'm going to switch to manual. Let's see if we can bring it here. Oops. Sorry. Give me a second. Okay. Yeah, no, this is, this is mine. <coughs> so, we found the CRISPR Cas, but since we're looking at community, we we're also able to find its target. I've mentioned that it targets viruses or phages, and we were able to find a phage that matches 100% one of the spaces of the CASEX. So what we had is a, 
is a new system, a potential target, and we wanted to test whether indeed it works. So we took this whole system and created a mini locus of CRISPR-Cas X, which includes only the Cas X and the predicted non-coding uh, regions, as well as the one spaces with a repeat. And the essay was very simple. We took this system, expressed them, synthesized them de novo, expressed them in E. coli, and tested them in two cases. In one case, we tested with a plasmid that contained antimicrobial resistance and a, a target for the systems. In this case, we expect the system to target the plasmid because it contains a perfect, a perfect target to one of the spacers. And if it, if it targets the plasmid, it's supposed to clear it, and there will be no antimicrobial antibi antibiotic resistance. So if we grow it on, an antibiotic, uh, on a media containing antibiotic, it won't grow. On the other hand, if we use the exact same plasmid with a different target, we expect the plasmid to retain, and therefore it will, the bacteria will be able to grow on selective media. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but here we are testing uh, different dilution, dilutions of uh, microbes where we, we use a system with a spacer uh, that we call it X1, and the plasmid also had the target to X1, and we see that we have order, order of magnitudes less growth in when we target the spacer X1 than in the cases that we target a different spacer or that we have a plasmid with no target. And if we change the target, we see the exact same pattern. So if we target S SX2 with the system, we see no growth with the plasmid as the, the target for the system. And this is dependent on the CASX, because if we repeat this exercise without the CASX, uh, there is no cleavage. We repeated it several times to show that indeed this is, uh, this is robust. And to me, that was a very, very exciting point, because we were able to take for metagenomics, from a bacteria that nobody heard of and nobody was able to grow in the lab, basically for what was before just a string of a DNA, completely theoretical, in our computer, to synthesize it, transfer it in E. coli, e. coli and show that it expresses and performs as predicted. Furthermore, we were able to find another, another system that we called CAS, CASY. This was a a system that was unique in its uh, architecture. Usually, we, I, I didn't get into the other Cas protein, but usually we have Cas1 and Cas2 protein, which are universal in almost any CRISPR-Cas system we know. And in this case, it was the most minimalist in sense of a uh, number of uh, proteins uh, in the system that included only CasY and Cas1, which was enough to have a functional system. Um, but I want today to talk about uh, more recent uh, family of uh, proteins we found, and this is the Cas14s. So after we found the first uh, Casx and Casy, we were really excited about this result, and we decided to to enlarge our search and look for additional uh, in additional environments and loosen our uh, loosen the, the parameters for searching new CRISPR-Cas systems. Specifically, we try to find CRISPR-Cas systems that are even smaller than the one we did before. So when we looked for systems that are below the, what was believed as the minimal threshold to find uh, for an operative CRISPR-Cas system, which was considered 800 amino acids, we were able to find small systems that really that looks like CRISPR-Cas system. So we find CRISPR-Cas system in the range between 415 amino acids to 744 amino acids. Just as a comparison, I think we have it here. These are the, this is the distribution of Cas9 systems. So you can see the length is around between 1,000 and up to 1,700. The smallest Cas9 here are ones found in metagenomes. Cas12, which is a synonym of uh, CPF1, are also very large protein, and these two are uh, the Casx, which I mentioned first, which are the smallest known of this family, and the Cas14 are really in a different range of legs, and that can be crucial when we want to use these in an uh, application that si when, where size matters. Now, I have to say, this is not one single protein. This is a large diversity of family of proteins, 
and we just call them all CAS14 because we didn't want to start finishing all the number of uh, CASs, but these are really divergent, different from one another. In a total, we found eight new families of CRISPR-Cas system, uh, 46 specific families. But this is just theoretical. When we try to check whether these tiny proteins indeed target double-strand DNA, it did not work. We tried in vitro, we tried in vitro, it did not work. Uh, so we tried other targets. And while single double-stranded DNA didn't work, single-stranded DNA was a very good target for one of these systems. So we were able to show that one of the Cas14A is very efficient in targeting single-strand DNA. As you see, we tried also single-strand RNA and it didn't target it. So we have a new tiny enzyme that is, is able to, to uh, cleave single-stranded DNA. Okay, is it unique? And is it useful for anything? In order to answer that, I need to go back to a, another study uh, performed by friends of mine, uh, Chen et al., where they showed uh, abil the ability of CPF1 to cleave single-strand DNA. So I've mentioned that CPF1, like Cas9, is able to identify double-strand DNA, and then it changes the conformation and is able to cleave the double-strand DNA. But what they identified is that it has another function, which is, uh, was, I mean, not known before and a bit surprising, is that we, if it identifies a perfect target of single-strand DNA, it changes conformation, cleaves it as it does to the double-strand DNA, but then it shreds it completely. Meaning after the CPF1 is activated, it turns into a non-specific single-strand DNA, DNAs. It will, it will cleave any single-strand DNA in its vicinity. And they've had a wonderful uh, idea to use it as a detection tool, where they use a molecule that contains on one hand a fluorophore and on the other a quencher, and they use it as a detection tool for their target. If the target is identified, any single-strand strand DNA will be cut, as I said. So they, they, they connect the fluorophore and the quencher with the single-strand DNA, which will also be cleaved. And if we have enough of those, we can get a signal uh, that we can just uh, see by, by the light it emits. So they were able to use this CPF1 in order to, to, de de to, sorry, to develop a detection tool that is very, very uh, specific. They were able to show it as low as uh, atomolar uh, um, concentrations. Now, one of the things they showed about, singles, about CPF1 when it targets single-strand DNA, that it, it can tolerate mismatches in the target. What we see here is a perfect target of single-strand uh, DNA to the CPF1. And here we see different mutation in different location of the target. And you can see it doesn't make much difference in the activation of CPF1 and turning it, turn it into a single-strand, non-specific single-strand DNAs. Now, this brings me, back, brings me back to the Cas14. When we did a similar assay for our Cas14 and we tested different position in the in the target for uh, sensitivity to mutation, you can see that there's a region that is much more sensitive to mutation than the rest. So in this seed region, the, the Cas14 is able to identify very specific mutations. And in order to prove that, we took a snip in the ERC2 gene that differentiate between blue eyes and brown eyes. And basically using saliva as a, as a source of DNA, we try to identify the specific SNP of A to G between the brown eye and blue eye phenotype. And here you see the results of this assay. This is the assay, this is trying to identify, uh, this is the assay with Cas14 with G at the SNP, and this is with A at the SNP. And you can see that the signal is very, very strong when you compare the, the attempt to identify the same SNP in uh, CPF1, where we, you, you can't really differentiate between the two cases. So to conclude uh, this last talk of the seminar, I, I try to convince you that 
if we use a community-based approach, we are able to, to identify rare protein that we wouldn't be able to identify otherwise. So this includes new systems that definitely operate on the nanoscale. Uh, we can find the target of the systems, and we can also find non-coding components of the system using metatranscriptomics that I didn't go too much into. One of the things that I find most exciting is that we are able to transfer this system from uncultured organisms into, in our case, E. coli and other cultured organisms and see that they work there. In the example of CASX, it was a copy and paste of the system as it is. We didn't even play with the promoter, we just took it at, as is and it was able to function well. Uh, and the last point I want to make is that the discovery I've, I've shown you are discoveries in very well studied Field. I mean, I'm not the only one looking for new CRISPR-Cas system, and the fact we found them says something about the potential of metagenomics in searching for such new en enzymes that might be relevant for nanotechnology. Uh, I want to thank uh, the labs of uh, Jennifer Downer and Jill Banfield where uh, this study research was done. Specifically, I want to, to thank uh, Lucas Harrington, which was a student in uh, the Downer lab that did uh, most of the uh, wet lab work there. Uh, I want to thank Lee for inviting me and all of you for the attention, your attention at this point of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dudu. I will ask if you allow the first question. So, what is the advantage of having a non-accurate genome editing machine? Because you've been studying some of these cases that can tolerate mismatches, so the audience who, are, who is not familiar with genome editing, the, it, the, the large advantage of the CAS-based systems is that they are very accurate. With previous genome editing approaches, miscleavage or off-site editing is a major problem. So now you are introducing a CAS-based system which is not accurate, so what is the advantage? So the advantage is not for genome editing. I definitely don't want to edit genome in, a not accurate, in an inaccurate way. The advantage can be in detection. So for example, if you want to detection an antimicrobial resistance uh, gene in the field or using a, a, where you can't really sequence, then you might want to allow specific SNPs in the gene, but you still want to detect it. That's one thing. And on the other hand, I, what we show with the CAS14, the new ones, is that they have higher rates of uh, accuracy, so the detection is more accurate. More questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Dudu. Thank you. Now I would like to thank and have a round of applause for all the speakers of uh, this session. And I will hand the microphone, I guess, for closing remarks and a prize ceremony.